For love, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them that despitefully use you. Was not Paul an extremist for the gospel of Jesus? I bear on my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Was not Martin Luther an extremist? Here I stand, I cannot do otherwise, so help me God. Was not John Bunyan an extremist? I will stay in jail for the rest of my days rather than make a butchery of my conscience. Was not Abraham Lincoln an extremist? This country cannot survive half slave or half free. So the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists will we be? Will we be extremists for hate or will we be extremists for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice or will we be extremists for the cause of justice? So maybe after all, the South, the nation and the world are in dire need of creative extremists. Appearing tonight, Tim Cook, Stacey Abrams, Jose Andres, and Ed Bastian. The Atlantic Festival is brought to you through the generous support of Facebook, Genentech, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Walton Family Foundation, Allstate, Eli Lilly and Company, U.S. Bank, AARP, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Exxon Mobil, John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, Nestle Waters North America, and PayPal. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeffrey Goldberg, the editor-in-chief of The Atlantic, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the first, and if things go better in the coming months, last all-digital Atlantic Festival. I'd like to thank our friend John Batiste, who is The Atlantic's music director, he also has other jobs, I believe, for providing that amazing rendition of the battle hymn for our opening. And a special thank you to another good friend of The Atlantic's, Anna DeVere Smith, for that moving reading of Martin Luther King Jr.'s letter from Birmingham jail that was first published in The Atlantic in 1960. For those of you who don't know The Atlantic, our magazine was founded 163 years ago to be, among other things, the town square for debate and illumination of the American idea. The founders, including such giants as Longfellow, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Harriet Beecher Stowe, Herman Melville, didn't define for future generations the American idea. That's the work they left us, each generation of Atlantic journalists. What we believe in this moment of high tension and national fracturing is that we should be helping America understand itself, its role in the world, and its future as a democracy. Our magazine was home to some of the greatest writers in American history, Frederick Douglass, Mark Twain, Ernest Hemingway, Helen Keller, W.E.B. Du Bois, Virginia Woolf, and many, many more. And we try to carry on the tradition today. At our best, we hold the powerful accountable and provide our readers, through great reporting, writing, and thinking, new ways to make sense of the world. And we give them great stories as well. 
We're here today and over the next few days to explore this very strange year and to try to figure out with our guests where we're headed. There's a lot on the plate. We're struggling through the pandemic and we continue to deal with a society-wide racial reckoning and a set of unique challenges to our democratic way of life. The death of Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the pitched political battle over her replacement adds to the tension and chaos of this year. And it highlights just how divided our nation has become. The October issue of our magazine is focused on some core questions about America's identity and purpose. We call that issue the Making America Again issue. The festival carries that mission to our virtual stage. This week, we'll hear from some of the most influential leaders in politics, business, media, and culture as we explore what it will take to build a more perfect union. I hope you enjoy these conversations this week. Late last week, I spoke with Apple CEO Tim Cook. Tim Cook now. Tim, thanks very much for, for joining us. Sorry. Thanks very much for inviting me. It's great to be here. Yeah, I wish that we had you at the uh, live version of the Atlantic Festival, but um, I'm in a room with uh, just stuffed with Apple products, so it's almost like you're here. Uh, but thanks for coming thanks on. Thanks very much. And, and I wanted to just jump right in. I just wanted to jump right in and, and ask you something about the last couple of weeks in California where you are, uh, uh, tell us what you've seen and experienced of these fires over the last couple of weeks and and pivot, if you will, to um, to what you think this means for climate change and, and, and climate awareness. Yeah, the, the first responders have had quite a job over the last few weeks uh, trying to get the fires under control. A number of our employees and a number of other people uh, had to evacuate and uh, some are still evacuated uh, currently. Uh, so it's, it's been tragic and it, it's a reminder of how serious climate change is and what's at stake. Uh, of course, for, for the rest of us that weren't evacuated, we have the air quality issue and it's, uh, it's horrendous. You really don't wanna go outside at all. But, but the, the people that, that have been on the front lines are where my thoughts mainly are and the people that were evacuated, including the people that lost their homes. You've been thinking about this issue for a long time and, and Apple has been thinking about this issue for a long time. You think this will help people move into a new phase of understanding? And, and talk a little bit about what you and your company want to do about it. I think the sum total of all of these, the, the wildfires in the West, uh, that's essentially, you know, burning millions of acres in the, in the West. The hurricanes in the South at my uh, hometown, the flooding that's taken place in the Northeast and, and the Mid-Atlantic region, all of these together, I do believe will, will get and convince the people that are not currently convinced about climate change. What, what we've been doing, and we've been doing this for a long time, uh, a couple of years ago, after many years of work, we were able to run Apple on 100% renewable energy. And so this is a, a significant uh, uh, achievement that took, took place over many years. And what we're now doing is we've set 2030 as the date at which not only the internal portions of Apple would run at 100% uh, renewable energy, but we want to do that same thing uh, for the power that our uh, products use after they're bought and the supply chain that makes the products itself. We want all of this to be carbon neutral. And so we're taking a very, very comprehensive view of, of our carbon footprint, uh, really leading in this, this manner. And we're, we're hoping that other companies join us uh, and not wait for regulations that, that push us in that way. You know, something you said uh, just, just struck me. You said that maybe this will push some people who maybe aren't taking this as seriously to take it seriously. Um, there's one person in, in, in mind, uh, in my mind, who, who seems to be impervious to, to climate information, and that's the current president of the United States. I know that you spent a lot of time talking to him about various issues. And, you know, I, I let's put it this way. It seems to me that, that you and the, and the president have, have slightly different temperaments. And, and approaches to, to problem solving. And, and you know, I, I'm curious to think, to, to, to see if you've um, 
had the experience of being able to change his mind or if you can characterize in any way what those exchanges are like. I think even just from the climate perspective, there are a lot of people who want to know uh, if if we're going to be able to see a shift in the way he thinks about those issues, especially after the fires. Well, I, I kind of view the conversations that I've had as, as private conversations, so I don't want to talk about it in detail. But if you sort of back up from it, my, my whole philosophy, Jeffrey, is engagement. And uh, I believe that it's much better to, to be involved, whether you're in agreement on an issue or I think it's even more important to engage when you disagree on something. And, and so what we do at Apple is we focus on policy. We don't focus on the politics. And so it, it keeps us out of the, the sort of the daily scrum of politics and keeps us very focused on the things that, that are very important to us. Some of those things are environment is very important. Uh, DACA is very important for us. We have over 400 employees that are in the company and uh, they are here on DACA. And my, my, my view is pretty simple on this, is they're every bit as an American as I am. And uh, I want to see them taken care of. And I'd like this cloud that's been lifted, or this cloud to be lifted that's been hanging over them. Uh, there are many, many other things that uh, are on our mind too, and there, including some that uh, we worked that we work with the administration on it in agreement, like workforce training. Uh, you know, I think one of the key issues of our future is: do we have the skills in the workforce to prepare for the future jobs, not necessarily current jobs, but for future jobs? You know, are we skating to where the puck is going to be? And uh, this is an area that we've engaged in with the administration and and have had some and had some really good activities come out of it. Let me ask you about another, uh, 2020 has presented any number of challenges, COVID-19 obviously being possibly the primary. You're, you're responsible uh, for almost 100,000 employees in, in America and a lot of different states. Um, how would you characterize the American response to COVID-19 so far? Well, I can tell you how we've responded. Uh, we looked at ourselves in the mirror very hard and say, how can we help? And we turned the company upside down in every single area of the company and uh, did something that we felt would make a contribution. So l let me give you some examples on that. You know, we have a supply chain team and they're a world class supply chain team. We'd never used it to source masks before, but we knew that there was a shortage of masks. And so we diverted some of our skills to finding, sourcing, and then donating over 30 million masks around the, around the world. We also use our design team that, that knows how to look at things and find and, and create things in the simplest form possible. And we, we uh, created a face shield because face shields were in shortage and we donated over 10 million of those. Uh, we knew that test kits were in shortage. And so we we looked at and we mapped out the supply chain in the, in the test kit arena and found this great company that needed help in scaling. Well, we know how to scale. We didn't know about, very much about test kits, but we know how to scale production. And uh, now there's millions of test kits coming out of this, coming out of this company. Uh, we knew that fake news was a problem. And so we, we uh, have a special portion of Apple News that focuses just on COVID so that people can go there and, and uh, feel good about that they're getting information from trusted sources. And so really all throughout the company, we ask ourselves the question, how can we help? And uh, you know, didn't, didn't wait to be asked, frankly. Right, I mean, let me just stay on this for one yeah. more second uh, because it, it is, it is so important. I, I mean, I, I, I appreciate your, your care and, and caution in talking about this, but you're a person, you know, you're, you're in practically every country in the world. You've seen countries that have responded very well to COVID-19. I don't think there are many people who think that the U.S. has responded to COVID-19. I'm wondering, just even from the perspective of an American citizen, if you could diagnose some of the problems that we've had over the past six months and not suppressing this virus. 
Well, I think this this virus caught uh, the world by surprise, Jeffrey, and it's 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 significant. And uh, I think there will be time for lots of lessons learned about things that we could all do better. And uh, I ho I hope that we take a hard look at that as we get on the other side of the virus. Um, before I, I want to go to some big issues that you're facing, including issues about privacy. Uh, and, and obviously some, some things that have to do with your, the future of your company. Yeah. But I, I, I'm curious about something, uh, because your company has a very interesting culture. Um, you built recently one of the world's uh, most uh, elaborate and expensive office buildings, uh, Apple Park. Um, in order to, to cultivate spontaneous uh, interaction with employees, serendipity and, and invention and, and create creativity, um, I'm wondering what challenges you're facing right now as the manager of a very large company where no one is going to the office. I mean, tell me how you as the manager of this operation have dealt with this new reality. I, I think this might be a, a question that a lot of people who run things would be interested in hearing. You know, we, uh, like m many others, uh, we've been primarily remote since March. And so we've got six months under our belt now, we're still learning. Uh, I would say that uh, I'm incredibly impressed with our teams and their resiliency. You, you can see from the announcements that we made this week with the uh, Series 6 watch, with the SE watch, with the iPads and, and a new service called Fitness Plus, you can see that we've continued on the innovation trail. Um, I would tell you, though, Jeffrey, in, in all candor, uh, it's not like being together physically. And so I, I can't wait uh, for everybody to be able to come back into the office. I, I don't believe that we'll return to the way we were because we found that there are some things that actually work really well virtually. But uh, things like creativity and the serendipity that you talk about, these things, you depend on people kind of running into each other over the course of a day. We've, we have designed our entire office such that there are common areas where people congregate and talk about different things, and you can't schedule those things. And, and so I, I think the vast majority of us can't wait until we can be back in the office again. Uh, you know, hope, hopefully that occurs uh, uh, sometimes next year. Who, who knows exactly what the date may be? Uh, we've got about 10, 15 percent of our population working today in the office. Uh, I'm in the office uh, uh, at different points of during the week as well. But the vast majority, the 85, 90 percent of the company is still uh, uh, still working remotely. Let me turn to a couple of other issues quickly. I, I'm curious to ask you this. If, what what bothered you more, the idea of being called to testify about uh, antitrust issues before Congress or being called to testify in front of Congress alongside Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook? I think that uh, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Um, I think that big companies deserve scrutiny. And, and I, I think that's a fit, not only fair, but important for the system that we have in, in America. And, and so I have no issue at all in Apple being put underneath the microscope and people looking and probing. And um, my, my hope is, Jeffrey, is that as people heard our story, and as they continue to hear our story, that it will become as apparent to them as it is to us that we have no monopoly. There is no monopoly here. We're in uh, very, very competitive markets like smartphones and watch smartwatches and, and tablets and uh, personal computers. These things are fiercely competitive. They're basically street fights for market share every day. And, and our strategy, our core strategy as a company to make the best, not the most, that's, that basic strategy uh, will never produce a monopoly because it is rare, it's, it's very rare, almost impossible for the best to become the most as well. Somebody will choose a commodity product and there's enough people that buy the commodity product. 
uh, that it will have more share. And, and that's true in, in all of the different fields we're in. So I'm hoping that people heard that and, uh, and heard how we conduct ourselves because it's, this thing, it's very important to us. We always do what we believe is right and uh, conduct ourselves with the utmost integrity and professionalism. And so I hope that that came across and that, uh, that we can uh, sort of unpeel from this investigation. Right. Uh, stay on, this, uh, on the general subject of uh, companies you're grouped with. Um, I get the sense, uh, listening to Apple over time, that there's a certain level of resentment in being grouped in with uh, social media companies. And I'm wondering if you could talk about um, your critique of some of those companies through, through the prism of privacy issues, because I know this is that's one of the baskets that you, you spend most of your time on or a lot. We see privacy as a basic human right, very fundamental human right. And from our point of view, if you look at it from a U.S. perspective, uh, it is the foundation of which other freedoms uh, exist. Freedom of expression, uh, freedom of the press. Um, it, it is so core, it's a core civil liberty. And without that, when we worry about the whole stack beginning to erode, and so forever, not, it's not something that I began, but since, uh, since Apple was founded, uh, we've always worried about people's privacy because we saw the day, not exactly how it played out, but we saw that the digital world had um, the capability to destroy the privacy. And so I know we've been uh, a bit on an island. Uh, there are more people coming on the island, which I'm very happy about. Um, but we've made a set of different choices than uh, some other companies have made. Uh, you know, we, we, we don't develop the detailed profile of people. We think that that's something that people inherently don't want people to have, that there's a that there's uh, basic information that should be kept personal for people. And, and so we, we, we have steered clear of that and we've, you know, we've fought to, to keep it and uh, we'll continue to because it's a, it's a core part of what our users want. There's another moral issue that I wanted to raise with you. And, and you're a person who's obviously taken stances in, in, in your life, some brave stances, uh, quite obviously. Um, I'm wondering what, what keeps you up at night. Um, your most important partner, uh, apart from the United States itself, the most important country is China. China has a very different kind of human right, rights record than the United States. They have concentration camps filled with Muslims. Um, I'm wondering, like, talk, talk, talk about the complication of being a CEO that's dependent on, on countries that um, have very different policies and very different ideas about human rights and privacy by the way, than, uh, than the United States. Uh, I guess this is the what keeps you up at night or what, what compromises are you making that you chew on? Jeffrey, we always look through to the user. The user is the center of our world, the customer. And, and so when I look at China, I see a significant number of users that love Apple product and, and I want to serve them. And I do that whether I'm looking at, um, China or, uh, you know, a, a country in Europe or country in Latin America. So we look through to the user and we believe everybody should be treated with dignity and respect. It's a, it's a, sort of our basic belief as a company. And, uh, and I, I, I believe strongly personally that in, in a time where there is significant uh, geopolitical tension, uh, and, and I, I mean any set of countries, not, not just uh, the ones you mentioned here, is that one of the few things that people can get together on is doing business together. And so I think it puts even more pressure on business to be part of the link that holds things together. Uh, I think academia has a role there as well, uh, but there are few these days 
there are few things that really that really tie people together, and uh, I'm glad that that business is one of those, and I, I hope that it remains one of those and sort of steers clear of the of the politics. One last question for you, and it's about you. Um, you are running the world's most successful company. Um, it's grown tremendously under your leadership. Um, Two trillion dollar market cap. Uh, a, a smartphone that um, at least uncreative people like myself think, how many more things can they put onto this before they run out of room or run out of ideas? Uh, the, question, the question for you is, how long are you going to do this before you go find something else to do? I mean, are there markers that you have in your own life in terms of achievements uh, at Apple that, um, that you, know, you say to yourself, okay, I, I think I might have done it, so I want to move on declare success. And, and you know, I, I consider the privilege of a lifetime to be here in this role at this time. Uh, I love working with this team. Uh, I consider them family. And, uh, and it, I, it's hard to explain. And it may, it may sound uh, like it's messaging or something, but it's not. It's, it's, it's that deep in my heart is that uh, I really love the people I work with. And it, 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 currently, it's tough to envision my life uh, without that. And so we'll see. You know, I'll, um, at some point, of course, we all do something different. But um, at the moment, there's no place I would rather be than right, right here. Does the two trillion number mean anything? It, to you? Will it mean something to your shareholders? It, uh, well, they're not going to be very happy with what I'm going to answer this then, because it is not a fixation of ours. Um, it is not a fixation at all. We don't follow the, the market cap of the company. It's not why we do what we do. Uh, from our point of view, what we want to do is make the world's best products that enrich people's lives. And so what turns us on is w watching how our products are used out in the wild. And, and whose life they're improving. That's what gets us up in the morning. You know, I, I get up every morning and the first thing I do is read customer emails. I read about people who got a uh, notification on their watch and found out they had a serious medical issue after, after reaching out to their doctor. And we, we prevented that. And, and it's uh, prevented it from becoming a real issue. And so uh, these are the things that, that drive us. And we think that if we do those well, if the user stays at the forefront of our, our mindset, if we make the best products, then we'll have a good business and our shareholders will be happy. But the, the, sh the stock price is a result of doing the, uh, f the focus on users and products the best, not focusing on the stock price as a, as a primary focus. It's, it is a calculatable result. Tim, thank you very much for, for talking with us and, uh, and please stay safe. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for having me. It's an honor to be with the Atlantic and the, the civil rights history that the Atlantic has. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. The Atlantic Festival is brought to you through the generous support of Facebook, Genentech, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Walton Family Foundation, Allstate, Eli Lilly and Company, U.S. Bank, AARP, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, ExxonMobil, John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, Nestle Waters North America, and PayPal. Next, welcome Atlantic contributing writer and co-host of Showtime's The Circus, Alex Wagner. Voting is at the heart of our democracy, but even in 2020, the right to vote is not guaranteed. While some allege voter fraud is rampant, others point to voter suppression as the real issue, the one denying many Americans their most fundamental right. Stacey Abrams knows too well about voter suppression, something she claims cost her the Georgia governor election in 2018. She is now the founder of Fair Fight Action, and she joins me now. Stacey, great to see you. Thank you for coming to the Atlantic Festival. Thank you. It's my pleasure. So let's just start first with um, the project you've been you know, most immediately involved in as, as it concerns uh, the viewing public, All In. It's a new documentary. It is a riveting 
distressing documentary on Amazon that chronicles voter suppression in America. You know, what what I took away from the documentary is that disenfranchising people of color as far as their right to vote has been something this country has been fixated on since its inception. And I wonder in making this documentary, do you think anything has measurably changed on changed on that front other than the tactics by which we have aimed to suppress that vote? Yes, absolutely. And I think that the goal of the documentary was not simply to raise the havocs of everyone and and the panic of the persistence of voter suppression, but to show the progress. At the inception of our country, we denied the humanity of Blacks, the existence of Native Americans, and the utility of women. Uh, And then you add in the 1790 Naturalization Act that said that only white people of good character would be allowed into the country. And so we've made dramatic progress through the 15th Amendment, through the 19th Amendment, through the Naturalization and Immigration Act of 1965, and of course, through the Voting Rights Act. What has happened though in the last 20 years, and more acutely since 2013, is a retrenchment, where we had this halcyon period during the Voting Rights Act, nearly 50 years, where we were really working to expand the vote, and now we've returned to defending the vote. And we're defending it for people of color, for young people, for poor people. And as long as we have to defend the right to vote, We're not engaging in the real work of democracy, which is engaging all of our citizens in the decision making of our country. Um, It feels like, I mean, voter suppression has always been of interest and importance, especially to those whose votes were getting suppressed. But it feels like it's taken on a sort of um, national alarm in the pandemic. President Trump seems to have realized early on in the pandemic that mail-in voting would be an area that could be (laughs) um, manipulated, shall we say, for partisan gain. When the pandemic struck, given all the, the work that you're doing on voter suppression, did you think the same thing? Well, we knew that there would be a a catastrophe in 2020. We had no idea it would be a pandemic, but we knew that the 2020 election was going to be a a mano a mano fight about whether we were going to be a democracy that looked to expand the access of the right to vote for those who were entitled or an attempt to limit those rights. Because this is a fight about power. Who has it and who has the right to, to use it? Donald Trump and his cronies realized early on that when more people participate, that changes the composition of the electorate. And often the people who've been not participating were the ones who would likely want something different. And so he told the absolute truth when he said he was deeply afraid that people using the right to vote to the extent that vote by mail would allow it, meaning that more people would be able to use the convenience of voting, that it would harm his reelection chances. But that's not a justification for the behavior that he's exhibited or for the fights that are being waged across this country. Because when we return to the fundamentals of democracy, no one who believes in our country should be fighting to stop people who are legally eligible for vote for voting to stop them from doing so. Let's just drill into the tactics that are being employed uh, at present. The first is the, the sort of under-resourcing or dismantling of the resources at the U.S. Postal Service, which is predicted to play an outsized role in this election, given the fact that a lot of people are going to be voting by mail, a large proportion of them Democrats. You have seen the news coverage. You know well how the system works. Do you think that it could be the, 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 the tactics employed thus far could be effective in sowing chaos at the very least, if not outright disenfranchisement on Election Day? I I believe that had the Louis DeJoy, Donald Trump tactic go uh, gone unnoticed, it would or certainly unattacked, unattacked, it would have worked. They were attempting to slow down the process of mail delivery, but also sow chaos, as you pointed out. What went wrong for them was that the Postal Service is more than just a way to win an election. The Postal Service is how people get medicine, how they get food. If you've ever lived in a rural area, it is a lifeline. And this deep underestimation of just the vitality and the utility of the Postal Service worked against them. And because there was a hue and cry that went up in August and not in October, I think we've mitigated much but not all of the harm 
that was done to the Postal Service. As you and I both know, the sorting machines in too many of our post offices are now irreparably damaged. I live next door to a, a post office and I went to go and mail something and my, my mailbox, the little box I used to drop off my mail had been taped shut. Luckily the tape came off, but we're not going to see this reorganization of sorting machines. But because of that, we have seen citizens take responsibility and demand drop boxes in their community. They now know where their county election office is. And so I think the chaos and intentionality is still there and it's still working. But what's different in this year is that when voter suppression reared its head yet again, people were ready to see it and ready to fight back. And that was the purpose of All In. That's the purpose of Fair Fight. That's why I wrote my book on it. it, it that's why I've been working on this for so long. It's not enough to know something exists if you can't articulate it and fight back against it. It just feels like strategically, to say nothing of morally or ethically, the president made a misstep and his allies made a misstep in telegraphing that they were going to try and undermine the institutions that are engaged to provide a fair vote. And there is nothing that motivates people to go to the polls or to cast votes or to organize than being told that they are being disenfranchised. So tactically, it just feels like a real misstep. Do, would you agree with that? Absolutely. Let's be clear. Voter suppression is not only not new, it's not even new in the 20th, 21st century. We have been used to the this notion that voter suppression is violent and oppressive and visible. And what's been so unique about voter suppression in the 21st century is that it looks like administrative rules. It looks like barriers uh, erected by bureaucracies. And as Americans, we've gotten used to bureaucratic barriers, so we just roll with them. What we've tried to do, and certainly what I tried to do with my election, was to acknowledge the legal sufficiency of the election based on the rules that they existed, but to call out the rules themselves and to say, I'm not going to make myself governor. My anger and dismay is not sufficient to overcome what the rules say. But for the voters who were denied their right to be heard, that should anger you. And you should, you should attack a system that denies you your agency as a citizen. And because we have spent more time since 2018 in conversation about this, in deliberate action about this, yes, the Republicans, mainly led by Donald Trump, but let's be very clear, this is a Republican strategy that has been imposed and employed across this country. The, the notion was it had worked in 2016, it worked in 2017, worked in 2018, why should it not work in 2020? The difference was we started talking about it because you're absolutely right. When people are afraid, they tend to curl into themselves. They tend to be scared. They tend not to act. But when they're angry, people want what's theirs. Even if they don't plan to use it, you don't have the right to take it from them. And what we were able to do in this year and in this context is rile up righteous indignation to overwhelm the chaos and fear. In, in the right timeline. I, speaking of timelines, I, I have to ask you, you know, there are uh, there are an army of lawyers on both sides here that are preparing for intense litigation after the election. There is something that has been termed in the political media uh, a red mirage. President Trump may get a, an initially uh, a plurality, a majority of the votes that are cast on election day, but as the votes are counted in the days after the election, there may be what is termed a blue shift where it looks like Democrats, where it appears numerically, the Democrats have actually won either critical seats or the presidency itself. A lot of people are saying we are headed towards civil unrest. What do you think? I think our first responsibility is to understand that we are living in an election season. It's just last call. It is not the closing down of the process. And because it's last call, our responsibility is to recognize that every vote cast, starting on September 4th in North Carolina through November 3rd, that those votes all count equally. And how we deliver those votes does not eradicate the utility and importance of those votes. The second piece is that the, that phalanx of attorneys you're talking about, they have been fighting litigation since June. And the reality is the fights that are being waged now matter as much as the fights that will be waged after the election. But the bottom line is delays in counting votes do not signal that someone has cheated 
or that the system is rigged. What it signals is that the system is working. It should take time to count hand votes. It should take time to verify. And when the states declare that they have finished their job, that's when we know. And that is why I've been working to call upon the media to not call the election. No one should be allowed to declare victory until we actually have information. We can't panic, but we also can't, we can't misunderstand math. You can't count something as done when there's still, there's still information out there. And whether that information is a blue shift, a red mirage, or more importantly, simply the process working, we have to have the patience of our process because that's what our democracy demands in a pandemic. In short, we should stop referring to it as election day and call it election season because it may Absolutely. not be days but weeks. Let me let me My sort of get your thoughts about the the moment we stand at right now. Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away uh, last week. There is a fierce, fierce partisan battle inside what is a larger kind of existential war happening inside the country. What were your what are your thoughts about the ways in which the Republicans in particular have reacted, the speed with which the president intends to nominate a successor and what that does to the, the balance of power in our democracy? One of the pieces we took pains to explain and all in for the fight for democracy was that voter suppression isn't a partisan issue. Different parties use it. The Whigs used it to, at the start of the country. Democrats were very strong purveyors in the 20th century. And in the 21st century, it's the province of Republicans because this is a fight over power. And it's a power over what we are as a country, where we go as a country, and who counts in our country. When I learned the news of Justice Ginsburg's death, I was saddened and dismayed, but I think in a different way than many because I'm a lawyer who follows the court. I know that the tilting of the court happened with the seating of Brett Kavanaugh. This is another flashpoint that reminds us of how our systems work or don't work. We've become so fixated on the courts in part because of the remarkable and remarkable inactivity of our Congress, namely the U.S. Senate. And if all three branches of government actually work the way they, they should, we would see less emphasis on these seats. But unfortunately, we are in a moment in our country where power is shifting where the composition of our country is different. Uh, in addition to the work I'm doing on voter protection, I'm fighting hard to save the census because we're about to have the most inaccurate census in nearly a century. We cannot allow that because it's also part of how we share and shift and gauge power in this country. And so where I stand is that we can't become so fixated either on winning an election that we miss losing the future. We can't become so fixated on one seat that we missed the other mechanisms for power in our country. And we cannot be so fixated on the presidency that we ignore Congress, state legislatures, even down ballot races as low as school board, because that's where so many of these conversations start. My mission is for us to understand our democracy and to allow as many people as possible to shape what the future looks like, but not let one battle consume the entire conversation of who we're going to be. I, I wonder how you think, you know, there are the there's the the poison we we dose ourselves with, the the battles we fight amongst ourselves. And then there are the external threats. And we talk a lot about voter suppression as a sort of self-inflicted wound. But we know from data, from intelligence briefings, that there are foreign actors that are seeking to undermine the integrity of American elections. Where does that rate on a, a sort of your scale of importance in terms of the 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 threats um the, the balance of power and democracy, the having a, a, a re responsive government that is reflective of the will of the people. How much do, are you at, up at night thinking or worrying about Russian interference? I, I'm concerned about Russian interference, Chinese interference. If Myanmar gets angry, that's problematic. But part of my responsibility is to focus on the levers I can move. And unfortunately, our federal government, namely the president and the Republican held U.S. Senate has abdicated responsibility for action on foreign interference. But we know that foreign interference is largely designed to sow chaos, to, to, to alter the actual composition of votes by hacking into our databases and hacking into our voting machines. And that's one of the reasons vote by mail is so important in this year. 
It is a way to audit our elections. We will know how people voted because it will be on a piece of paper. It is not a solution to foreign interference, and the abdication of responsibility by the Republican-held Senate is wrongheaded. The abdication of responsibility, in fact, the refusal to acknowledge responsibility by the president is unconscionable. But the best way to meet the, the challenge of foreign interference is by overwhelming the polls with our presence. Foreign interference is designed to erode our trust and to disturb our ability to cast those ballots. But when we add more and more people to the process, their effectiveness is diminished. And that's the way I have to approach this conversation. Let me just ask you a question for everybody at home, able-bodied people who have access to PPE and can make the choice between voting in person or by mail. Do you have guidance for them this November? Absolutely. So one of the great things we did with the documentary, uh, it's a website called allinforvoting.com. And my, me my message is this, make a plan. So if you have the right to vote by mail with no excuses, and you do right now in 45 states, no excuses in 41 states, four other states let you use COVID as an excuse. But if you can vote by mail, plan to vote by mail, but plan for there to be some challenges. So then make a backup plan. In 40 states, you can vote early. Know if you can vote early in your state. So if vote by mail does not work, then you have the backup plan of going to vote in person early. And if that fails for some reason, then plan to go and vote on election day. But this notion that you can game the system and figure out which one works just isn't true. You don't know what the problem's going to be, but the best defense is to know what all of your options are and to be ready to use them. And very quickly, I'll tell you, I voted by, I intended to vote by mail in June this year in our primary in Georgia. Got my absentee ballot, filled it out, got ready to put it in the envelope and the envelope was sealed shut. In Georgia, it is against the law for me to slit open that envelope, put my ballot inside and tape it. I happened to know that. So I knew I had to instead vote in person. I was ready and therefore I was able to cast my vote. But thousands of people across this country live in states where they would have just used the tape because it makes sense and their votes would have been thrown out. I want those folks to know that when they, when you look and you can't find your ballot and they say your vote hasn't counted, be ready for that to be the problem because no one has time to learn election law. Know that your next step is to go and vote in person and then vote on election day. But I don't give primacy to any one of those options. I say use as many of the options as possible, but only vote once. Contrary to what the president says, only vote <laughs> once. Stacey, I'm not going to dwell on the fact that someone in Georgia made sure that your ballot envelope was sealed. <laughs> could it be coincidence or could it be deliberate? But we are very glad that you're Stacey Abrams and already had a backup plan to the plan. Everyone out there should have one as well. And they should also, before they vote, watch All In, which is available to watch on Amazon.com. Stacey Abrams, it is always wonderful to hear from you. Thank you for everything you're doing and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Alex. It's always a pleasure to be with you. Tonight and over the next few nights, we'll hear from some of our writers and contributors for what we are calling the Ideas File. These extremely smart people will bring their writing to life to help us better understand the world around us. There's no better way to start than with my colleague, the Atlantic's executive editor, Adrian LaFrance, who wrote our recent cover story explaining the phenomenon of QAnon. I'm Adrienne LaFrance, the Atlantic's executive editor. Today, I want to talk about conspiracy theories. Conspiracy theories seem to be everywhere these days, and I spent much of the past year working on a big story about conspiracy theories and specifically QAnon. I want to share some of the things I heard over the course of my reporting. One person told me she believes the moon landing was faked and the Earth is actually flat. Another person told me they believe the coronavirus is a bioweapon deliberately unleashed on the world by China and the quote-unquote deep state. Another person said she believes Donald Trump is secretly publishing military intelligence online. One man told me he believes John F. Kennedy Jr. didn't actually die in a plane crash in 1999, but instead was assassinated by Hillary Clinton. Now, when I asked this gentleman, what evidence do you have to possibly suggest such a thing could have happened? He didn't miss a beat. He said, what evidence do you have to say it didn't? 
So this is the state of things. We're living through a mass rejection of reason, a mass rejection of enlightenment values, and people are losing touch with reality at an alarming scale. But the thing is, humans have always believed in conspiracy theories. They've frequently sparked major movements and shaped consequential belief systems. Nearly 2,000 years ago, after a great fire leveled most of Rome, Romans began to say that the Emperor Nero had secretly ordered the fire so he could rebuild Rome the way he wanted. They even said, the night of the fire, that they saw him standing on one of the city's seven hills, plucking a stringed instrument in celebration. It's one of the most famous conspiracy theories in history. So we have to ask, why is what's happening now any different? Well, there are a couple things. For one, the President of the United States is a conspiracy theorist. He uses his office and his platform frequently to advance conspiracy thinking. Secondly, the technology is different. Only a few decades ago, the primary way to spread conspiracy theories was through letters to the editor of newspapers. You can see this when you look back at old archives, people writing in saying that the government's controlling the weather or that aliens had already arrived. Today, everyone is a publisher. All you need is an internet connection. The very architecture of the social web, the way it's designed, the way the most popular social platforms incentivize snap emotional reactions, speed and engagement, and make publishing so easy, all of this creates conditions that allow conspiracy theories to thrive and to spread at scale. So what can be done? A healthy democracy helps. That means strengthening the institutions that promote democracy, like a free and independent press, and the agencies that work on human rights and civil rights. It means making sure that people understand the value of the scientific method and how it works. It also means looking closely at the forces that have eroded democracy in the 21st century. People often treat the internet as if it's fully formed, finished. It is not. Right now, a startling few tech companies control our shared informational environment. Google, Facebook, Amazon, they are part oracle, part manipulator. They can toy with our emotions. They can even influence the outcome of elections, which Facebook's own research has demonstrated. So the problem is not merely the ubiquity of misinformation like conspiracy theories. It's the endless stream of facts, fictions, hoaxes, and propaganda, all bundled together and treated neutrally by those who profit off of the platforms where that material lives, then weaponized by bad actors. History shows us that conspiracy theories will always be with us. But until we can reimagine the informational environments where they spread and thrive, they will remain dangerously powerful. And now a session produced by our underwriter, Genentech. Hello, I'm Alexander Hardy, CEO of Genentech, a biotechnology company based in South San Francisco, dedicated to pursuing groundbreaking science and developing medicines for people with life-threatening diseases. Day in and day out, we've witnessed the many challenges medically disenfranchised patients face and how those challenges ultimately impact their health outcomes. COVID-19 has brought this into sharper focus, further exposing the long-standing inequity in our health system. We knew from our work in creating more inclusive clinical trials that there are many barriers to having diverse representation. When we started working to address those barriers, we wanted to learn more about why underrepresented populations are not being included in clinical trials. So we went straight to the source, the patient. We commissioned this landmark study of more than 2,000 patients to better understand how patients perceive and interact with the healthcare system. The findings illuminate these inequities with heartbreaking new clarity, particularly for the medically disenfranchised communities. That's why today's conversation is so important, because if we're going to truly end structural racism in our healthcare system, we cannot do it in silos. It will take all of us from first responders and researchers to providers and biopharma working together. And for us at Genentech, it means using our expertise, leadership position and resources to do what's best for our patients of all backgrounds. With that, I'd like to introduce Quita Highsmith, Chief Diversity Officer of Genentech, and Dr. Fabian Sandoval, CEO of Emerson Clinical Research Institute, who will discuss the study findings and what they tell us about what we must do to eliminate inequity. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to working towards equity together. 
Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Fabian Sandoval. I'm CEO and Research Director of Emerson Clinical Research Institute, as well as founder of the Emerson Diversity Health Foundation. And I'm proud to say that part of our foundation, I'm also the Emmy-winning host of a whole team of us from a TV show that was sponsored in part by Genentech called Tu Salud, Tu Familia, which is your health, your family. And we're very proud of that. And this is a very exciting time that we're actually going to get to speak uh, today about um, health disparities and equities that really we think exist but don't. So in this conversation, I have the pleasure of actually speaking on this discussion with, uh, with Quita Highsmith. Hi, Fabian, Dr. Sandoval. Uh, as Fabian said, I'm Quita Highsmith, Chief Diversity Officer at Genentech. And certainly for me, this health equity discussion is very important. Before I became the Chief Diversity Officer, I was Head of Alliance and Advocacy Relations. And when I was in that role, we were planning a patient summit a few years ago, um, and we wanted to have a diverse set of patients participate in the summit, but we could not find, at, identify not even one Black or Hispanic patient that had participated in the clinical research. So myself and my partner, Nicole Ritchie, we really started to pressure test our, our thinking around why is the more diverse patients participating in the clinical research. So a few years ago, we started an initiative that Dr. Sandoval is a part of called Advancing Inclusive Research. And it's kind of led us to this journey where we are today to really understand the thinking behind diverse patients not wanting to participate in clinical research. So Quina, Tell me a little bit about the findings of this study that was so important for diversity. You know, the, the findings for this study that we commissioned, we wanted to really understand why are diverse patient populations not participating in, in research. And what we did was we conducted a landmark survey of 1,200 Black, Latinx, LGBTQ and lower socioeconomic status, as well as 1,000 patients from the general population, asking them firsthand about their experiences navigating the healthcare system. And what we found from these 1,200 individuals that were medically disenfranchised is they had trouble accessing quality care. They indicated that they had been treated unfairly while receiving uh, care regardless of their like race, sexual orientation, gender, income. And the results confirmed what I already knew. What many found surprising is that half of the medically disenfranchised patients feel like the healthcare system is rigged against them. It's not that the, there are just flaws in the system. These groups feel like the system is actively not operating in their best interest for their health care. And what the result of this is, is that they're actually delaying care. Medically disenfranchised patients are delaying or even discounting care because they don't feel understood. So when I saw the results of the study, I wasn't actually surprised, right? Because we know that communities of color often don't trust the healthcare system. Uh, there have been many examples, whether we go back to Tuskegee, whether we go to Henrietta Lacks, where communities of color have felt like they've been experimented on and haven't been part of the system. And so I think these results actually validated what we already knew, that there is a distrust among communities of color and medically disenfranchised regarding does the healthcare system care about me? You know, one of the things that we have been doing and we've been taking very seriously and you know, and, and you are very well aware is we've been looking at how do we diversify our clinical work and, and one of our other members of our external uh, uh, council, Mitzi Williams, um, had a great idea around a study that we needed to do specifically in multiple sclerosis um, called CHIMES. And so what we're looking to do is, you know, sp specifically understand multiple sclerosis in African-American Latinx patients to understand why is the disease uh, severe? Why does the, it progress? 
more um, with African Americans and Latinx, right? And so we as an industry have to begin to think about how do we resource these trials specific to communities of color so that we can really understand what are the underlying di disease impacts for these patients. And I'm super proud of that effort. That's right. And that's probably um, one of the takeaways, right? As we kind of wrap up our discussion, Quita, um, I know for me, the voice that I need to make sure people understand is the value of supporting the kind of work that organizations like ours do, mm -hmm. supporting these foundations that are that are out there to try and continue this dream mm -hmm. and continue educating providers and continue educating patients on participating in clinical trials, because if not, it's not going to work for our children and our great grandchildren. So as we close up, uh, Quita, what are some some little nuggets of information that those that are listening to us can take away from from all the stuff that you have learned in your position yeah. in your role at Genentech that they can do right now? Well, you know, you're so right. The, like the work we're doing today, it matters to our children, our grandchildren, and our great grandchildren. And I think, you know, I'm excited about these types of conversations that we're actually putting the kind of elephant on the table, so to speak, to say, you gotta do mm -hmm. something about it. And I'm I'm very optimistic uh, because of, I'm seeing more and more conversations about this type of work is that we can come together and make a real difference. Well, this has been fascinating to learn all the information that is affecting our communities and individuals that haven't heard this have really learned something. So Quita, it's been a pleasure speaking with you as usual. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Sandoval. And for those out there who want to learn more about our efforts around advancing inclusive research, please go to gene.com and that's G E N E.com. Next, Atlantic Managing Editor, Jillian White. Hi, everyone. I have the privilege of talking to Chef Jose Andreas, the founder of World Central Kitchen, a nonprofit devoted to providing food to people living through disasters. And he's been a critical part of the COVID-19 relief. Jose, welcome to the Atlantic Festival. Thank you very much. Happy Thanks to be so much with you. for being here. <laughs> Great. So, I mean, first things first, this is such a trying time for everyone individually. It's an especially trying time for people in the restaurant business. How are you? How are you holding up? Well, I'm, I'm holding uh, well. I mean, listen, this is hard for everybody. Um, um, we are going something that we never imagined. Probably what we are going through Many of us, we only saw it on science fiction movies. Yeah. But it's happening. And we are all on this together. And this is such a powerful moment if everybody embraces that idea that yeah. you can think, like you can overcome the obstacles ahead on your own and trying to take care of your family. And that's it. But actually, if we think about it, we can overcome what we're going through if we all understand the meaning of working together with the people. So can you talk whatever to me? We're, we're gonna have as leaders, we need to have leaders that understand the three beautiful words in the creation yeah. of America. We, the people, is what is gonna move all of us forward. I am trying to be there next to the people. Is people helping me and I'm trying to be there helping them. I was going to say, can you talk to me a little bit about what you're doing? Obviously, people know you so well as a chef, know your famous restaurants, but so much of your work in recent years has focused on getting food to people who need it most. What does that look like in the age of coronavirus and COVID-19? You know, we've seen this work from you before in hurricanes and kind of ravaged places, but this is just on the ground in the U.S., no kind of natural disaster, just day-to-day -day life. So what has that work looked like in COVID-19? COVID-19? Well, listen, uh, very simple. Um, the men and women of World Central Kitchen, uh, we are on our way of reaching uh, 40 million meals on this pandemic wow. alone. Uh, we've been serving food in thousands of places every day. At one moment, we've been serving over 300,000 meals a day. 
We are in more than 40 states. We've fed hundreds of hospitals from New York to San Francisco. Uh, we've been in places as COVID-19 was becoming uh, a reality, even in communities that they thought they, they were not going to get it, like the Navajo Nation, a Navajo Nation that uh, very much covers four states in the heart of America. And we've been there next to them, uh, helping them go through this pandemic. So at the end of the day, the men and women of Wall Central Kitchen, we've been there to take care of what nobody saw coming, from homeless to shelters to elderly homes, to first responders, to hospitals, nurses, and doctors. We've been there next to the people solving quick problems in a moment, beginning in March, that very much everybody went uh, to shut down their business and everybody stay home to quarantine. The men and women of Wall Central Kitchen, we were out in the world trying to transform problems into solutions. That's incredible. What, what are the people of World Central Kitchen seeing as they are out there trying to feed so many of these people? Well, uh, the reality is that for the men and women of World Central Kitchen, we've seen this from the very beginning. Me personally, I was following what was happening in China. Everybody that knows me, uh, they have an idea that I'm very interested in how we feed people through uh, hardships. And when I saw what was going on in China, I tried to learn how people were eating and were being fed in China itself, in the heart of China, in Wuhan. This gave me a very good idea of trying to, to think, wow, if this is gonna hit America, how we will respond. Mm. Before we knew, we were responding because in February we had people in Japan. We had to send a team to help feed uh, the Princess cruise ship, if you think about it, almost the first major cruise ship that got COVID cases. From there, we went to Auckland at the call of the governor of California, and we began also feeding the Princess cruise ship there. Through all of these, we've seen how people, they've been acting to this day. We need to understand that six, seven, eight months ago, nobody knew how to respond to Wuhan, uh, what was happening in Wuhan, what was happening with this virus. And all of a sudden, we had all to adapt. So for us, the most important was learning with boots on the ground. First thing, the men and women that were central kitchen, the first thing I did was writing down a health protocol to tell restaurants, to tell cooks, to tell our teams and the restaurant community how to behave inside the restaurant and how to behave outside the restaurant as we understood the restaurants had to be occupying an important role in feeding. So the reality today is this that we had many problems before in America and around the world, that this pandemic is only making bigger. Now the problems are very obvious. And what we're trying to do is two things, make sure that we cover the problems as we see them coming, but also we are showing governments how the response should be happening. So today I see lines of hunger in America, lines that I never imagined I was going to see in the most powerful country in the world. And we are here to try to make sure that we tell our president, that we tell Congress, guys, we have these problems, but these problems have a very simple solution. Let's make sure that we keep everybody fed. Let's make sure that we keep everybody healthy in the process. And let's make sure that in the process of feeding people, we are also helping restart the economy. You know, it, it begs the question, and you brought this up a little bit in your first answer when you talked about leadership, what is your view, given that you and your people have been on the ground in so many places, of the government response as it relates to hunger, as it relates to food supply? How do you think the government has been doing? I think right now that every time we make any comment becomes highly politicized. Uh, seems that if you are criticizing the response of somebody, uh, means that you are from the other party and vice versa. I've been yeah. always all my life to try to be very pragmatic. And what I know is this. I think that food is an afterthought. I don't think we take food um, ser serious enough. I think right now we need to understand that the food U.S. policy is making America sick and in the process is making the world poorer. And I think should be in the best interest of Congress to feed America 
in the best possible way. Obviously, it's going to be a lot of um, disagreement in what that means. But the reality is this. America today, uh, the richest country in the face of Earth, has an obesity pandemic, has a health issue, and all those issues, a very big reason, are based on the farm bill that makes calories highly accessible to people, calories with not a lot of nutrients, that is making huge amounts of Americans sick and creating national security issues like, right now, our military doesn't have enough young men and women to fulfill their needs. This is a national security issue. Right now, we are having, because climate change that we are not addressing, the moment that one day we may wake up and it's not enough cereal, corn, soy production to export, and maybe one day even less to feed Americans. We take food for granted. Are you worried about a hunger epidemic being layered onto the health pandemic that we have right now? How concerned are you about hunger specifically in this moment? I, I, we've seen through this uh, pandemic long lines in the food banks. We've seen through this pandemic school systems reacting differently to this entire uh, situation, where some school systems, they kept feeding children, but, but where other school systems shut down. We've seen through this pandemic that SNAPs, what we call food, food stamps, they've not been there to meet the needs of people. For example, if you are an elderly person, and you cannot go out because all of a sudden you don't have any help at home coming to do basic shopping. And all of a sudden you don't have enough money to call the companies that charge a lot to bring you food home. It will be so smart that we will put the food stamps at the service of feeding those elderly person at home that they will put their lives at risk if they adventure outside their door. We were not there to make a quick decision to allow our elderly, especially elderly in need, to be feeding themselves in a safe way. Uh, the school systems, we didn't increase the school uh, lunches to not only feed the children, but also why not feed the families in need. We didn't use those systems of distribution. Even in some places, we saw good news. Some people use the yellow buses to do food distribution through the different uh, neighborhoods where those buses will, in the old days, pick up the children. They became kind of delivery. So it's good news. Things happen at some levels, but in many other levels, we fall way short. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things we've seen so much during this epidemic has been um, celebrities, people of note, uh, people in the public eye really coming forward to start their own initiatives. Obviously, World Central Kitchen has been around for quite some time, and you've been doing this. But I heard that you are partnering up with a friend, um, LeBron James, who is working on a voter advocacy organization. Can you talk to us about that partnership and also how you see your causes as being aligned? Well, right now, all the options are, are on the table. Um, we have uh, election uh, day coming, and, and we realize that um, we've been having some issues because this pandemic and because the, the polling places, uh, some of them, they've been closing down, and we've been putting more people uh, in, in, in one polling place that this began creating the, 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 the problem of too many people waiting in line, sometimes for hours, and we thought that we had to be doing something about it. So we began feeling already in some elections uh, a few weeks ago, uh, uh, people to try to learn if this really was a problem. And at the end, this is very simple. We are creating this idea of chefs for the polls that work there is where you're gonna be able to see. And the idea is simple, that any American, any American that is hungry, uh, waiting online, because they are in places that is not even restaurants open, we will make sure that we are there to feed any American that won't exercise the right 
to vote and being part of the democrat of the democratic system that America is all about. So we're going to be here to make sure that nobody is hungry or thirsty waiting for long hours online and that will be the idea and yes we will partner with anybody that has the same very simple humble idea that is the beginnings of America to make sure that everybody is able to vote and express themselves uh, on election day. Yeah. What do you say to people who are surprised to see people kind of coming out of what they would consider their lanes? So you're a chef. LeBron James is obviously a sports mogul um, and an NBA player. What would you say to folks who criticize you guys and say that you don't need to be getting involved in pol politics or kind of organized action and should just stick to what you know? Well, when I became American a few years ago, uh, before uh, I, I did my swearing um, to America, to the Constitution, the number one thing they tell us is that to be an American is not to be active on the day that you are supposed to vote, a sacred day, a day that you express yourself and you help choose your future leaders that will keep moving all of us, we the people, forward. So for me, um, uh, I took that to heart because also they told me that to be an American is go beyond that, is being part of our democracy every day, to be an active citizen every day. So let's go back uh, almost uh, 200 years ago, Clara Barton. Many of us heard her name, but she was a nurse. That was more than a nurse. She was a hero. She was able single-handed to put a system as the nurse she was to take care of the wounded soldiers during the American Civil War. Thanks to Clara Barton, the Red Cross was created. She was a nurse and she took care of the people. Thanks yeah. to her, uh, America was slightly better. I'm a yeah. cook and I feed people. I'm here to do what we do best, making sure that no America will be hungry or thirsty, waiting for long hours. So if politics means being involved in the betterment of the lives of others, so I guess we are all into politics. I think politics is having a the wrong connotation. I think we right. all should be in politics. We all should be in the business of expressing ourselves with respect to our ideas and to respect to other people's ideas. But where we the people is above anybody. It's not about either person anymore, and I'm gonna impose on you, but it's on we the people. We're all together, we're gonna be uh, solving many of the problems that we face every day. So well, Jose, if that's politics, welcome to the politics. <laughs> well, Jose, thank you so much for the work that you were doing. Um, and thank you so much for being here with us. And to our audience, thank you so much for joining us for this conversation. The Atlantic Festival is brought to you through the generous support of Facebook, Genentech, Hewlett Packard Enterprise, Walton Family Foundation, Allstate, Eli Lilly and Company, U.S. Bank, AARP, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Exxon Mobil, John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, Nestle Waters North America, and PayPal. Please welcome from NBC News and MSNBC, Stephanie Rule. The airline industry has been turned on its head by the coronavirus pandemic. So the big question is, how does the industry survive at a time when few people are traveling for business or pleasure? How can it restore the confidence in the public that flying is actually safe? To discuss the state of the airline industry and how it will move forward, we are joined by the CEO of Delta Airlines, Ed Bastian. Ed, thank you so much for being with us. Good to um, be with you, Stephanie. Let's start with the state of... Uh, let's start with the state of the industry. No pun intended. It has been quite a trip. As far as the recovery goes, where's the industry? It has been quite a trip, and we are solidly in the recovery phase of that trip, though we have a ways to go till we get to our destination. Today, we're traveling and carrying volumes at about 30% of what we were this time a year ago. 
Uh, the Labor Day holiday was the busiest holiday. If you look at Memorial Day, Fourth of July, Labor Day, successive improvements in the overall volumes that we're carrying, but we still have a long ways to go. International is obviously considerably behind domestic, and a lot of the travel that's going on now is leisure as compared to business. Is there a, a goal, is there a point in time where you can see yourselves getting back to 80 or 100 percent? Absolutely. I have no doubt that we're going to get back to where we were. It's just going to take some time. Restoring confidence is our number one priority through this and the, the, having consumers that are willing to uh, travel, that's not a problem. People are interested in travel. It's the confidence they have, not just in the flight experience, but th the businesses aren't open. So there's no reason to go to visit a customer or the sales conventions aren't being held or the theme parks may not be open. So the entire travel ribbon has to open, not just the airline uh, component of it. Um, do you see business travel coming back, Ed? As you said, a lot of things aren't open, but even when they do, a lot of companies have realized they can get a lot of business done staying at home. I think business travel will come back. I don't know that it'll come back to the level it was in 2019. I do think there's a piece of business travel that will be replaced by video tools uh, because of the forced adaptation. We have no option. Uh, it, we'd much rather do this, this conference in person than uh, through all the technology channels and the glitches that we have to experience sometimes in putting these on. But the reality is the spirit wants to be with each other. Collaboration occurs. Relationships get solidified. New opportunities are created when we're together. And there's a, a strong desire when we talk to all of our corporates that they want to get back out on the road. They want to go see their customers. So video technology is a substitute, but I think it's a poor substitute substitute and the bulk of travel, business travel will come back, but it's going to take some time. Let's talk about the safe customer experience. In July, you said no mask, no Delta. At that point, you had over 100 names of people who weren't going to be welcome flying on Delta if they didn't adhere to the policies. What has happened since then? Well, we continue to, to enforce that policy, and today we're up to 350 people who we've had to put on the no-fly list because of their refusal to wear a mask once they get on board. Uh, you know, masks are the most important thing that we have to protect ourselves and to protect others in the face of the virus. And at Delta, we're using many layers of protection, the quality of the air, the filtration systems, we're capping load factors, we're blocking middle seats, we're electrostatically fogging every seat, every surface before every single flight takes off. But the mask is the core component of making certain that we keep our, our hygiene and, and the virus and any concerns around the virus contained. And so on board our planes, we are insistent that people wear masks. And occasionally we do find people that don't want to wear it and that's okay. And then we, we offload them and we make certain that they don't fly Delta again. How hard has that been to enforce for your flight attendants? It was hard initially because you, we don't want our flight attendants to be a form of a security uh, a cop or police state trying to trying to monitor the cabin. But realize we're an industry that's that's it, it adheres to rules and compliance. It's just the same as if you didn't want to wear your seatbelt on takeoff or landing or you wanted to stand up while we we're on the tarmac. We wouldn't allow for that either. And what you see, Stephanie, is that the customers themselves police it. Because if, you know, uh, all of our customers want to make certain that everyone is following this rule more than any other rule we have. And so the flight attendants get support from customers when they, they run into the occasional obstinate traveler, which are very, very few. We, we carried last week over a million customers, and we had only 25 or so people that we put on the no-fly list last week. So it's a very, very small number, but our people do a great job of that. Have you been flying Delta? Do you feel safe to fly? Absolutely. I've, I've flown every week throughout the pandemic. I can tell you not only do I feel safe, the experience is the best it's ever been. Uh, we rate our customer surveys, the satisfaction scores are really high. We're now our net promoter scores are 75 this summer. Last summer, we, we were at 50 and 50 was a very good number for a company of our scale. We're up to 75. So customers are telling us this is absolutely the best time to travel. There's apprehension when people get back out into the airports and, the, and travel because it's new, it's different. 
But after the first uh, tr trip or two, people are telling, and the lot, there's a lot of anecdotal word of mouth, people are saying it's the right time to get out and travel, and they're encouraging their peers to do the same. You mentioned blocking the middle seat and other safety precautions. You have taken more significant safety measures than other airlines have. That's expensive. Has it helped or hurt your bottom line? It's not helped the bottom line. We're, we're flying today uh, at a 60% load factor cap, so that means 40% of the seats we fly, we are deliberately not selling and not filling. That is not cheap. But the more important decision we make is we got to put people over profits, that we know that instilling confidence in our customers as well as our own employees is job number one. That's our priority right now. And that when people are, are feeling comfortable and want to sit in the middle seat, we will sell it again. It's not going to happen this year. Probably sometime next year, we'll, we'll get back to that point where there are vaccines and inoculations and medical advances that people feel confident in traveling again. But I'd, I'd much rather people remember Delta as the company that took care of them through the pandemic than was, was putting profits and trying to fill the seats up before customers were ready for it. My, uh, my boss, the chairman of Delta, Frank Blake, a good friend, said to me at the start of the pandemic that to remind me crises don't build character, crises reveal character. And customers are making a decision about who Delta is by the values that we put out on display every day. And our customers appreciate it and our people appreciate it. And they all will remember it. Customers will, but how hard is it for you to stick to that? People over profits is an important mission, but it's not something that shareholders like to hear. How much pressure are you under to bring back that middle seat, get rid of some of these ex expensive precautions? Well, it's uh, right now, I think our customers, uh, excuse me, our shareholders understand. Uh, when we look at the level of cash burn, that's how we're measuring. We're not, we don't have profits. None of, no one in the airline industry today has profits. We look at our cash burn. Our cash burn is actually as good or if not better than the other, the other airlines we're competing against, despite the fact that we're not selling 40% of the seats. So I think from a shareholder perspective, they realize we're making an investment in the future by not selling those seats, and we're not being inordinately disadvantaged because customers are rewarding us with their loyalty and their preference during this, these times. You've also said that you will not have layoffs for flight attendants or ground workers. How can you afford to do that? Is it because the government support you received? Well, the government did provide us support that carried us through for the six months following the start of the pandemic. That support expires at the end of this month, at the end of September. And at that point, the industry is facing some pretty large furlough risks uh, through many of, many of the airlines. At Delta, one of the things that we've done is that we've had enormous volunteerism. Uh, we've had up to 40,000 of our employees, almost half our entire employee base, take months of unpaid leave uh, at a time. So we've been able to offset almost 50% of all of our cost by those employees during this last six months, just by saying that we're not going to, we're, we're not going to fly. We'll stay home. We'll, we'll save the company that money. It's saving jobs for other people. We also had another 20% of our employees agree to early retire. We had a, had a nice early retirement package. So we had close to 17,000 people take those packages over the last couple of months. So the employees at Delta are stepping up and they're making the tough decisions for themselves to put jobs first. And if they could step aside to let another employee keep their job who needed it, they're doing that in the pandemic. And then many of the people decided to retire to allow the next generation to step up and have those opportunities. So as a result of that, we were able to save almost half of our labor bill during this period of time without involuntarily furloughing or reducing rates or any of, of any nature. So I'm really proud of the team. It, it speaks to the character again of, of who we are. Culture is everything. Um, when you think about the economy at large, right, you, you travel around the world. We talk about this recovery and it's very fragmented and fragile. How do you see things beyond just you know, your it, specific company in the airline industry? Yeah, it's 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 hard to read. Uh, it, it is fragile. I would I would agree with that right now. It's certainly being benefited by the amount of liquidity that's in the market as the Fed has opened up stimulus programs and the, the Fed has provided trillions of dollars into the economy. So there's a question of how sustainable 
some of that uh, recovery is at the moment. Uh, our business, as we know, is has been decimated. I think many of the businesses in the hospitality and leisure sector have been inordinately hurt, much worse than many others. You've got winners. You've got the Amazons. You've got the electronic uh, firms that have, that have actually taken advantage of the opportunity. But you have many, many people that are hurting. You know, the unemployment uh, roles in this country are large and uh, it's unclear when we get to the other side of some of the stimulus programs what the real state of the economy is going to be. When your government support runs out, are you going to be asking for more? The industry is looking for more, an extension for six months. I don't know that we will receive it. Uh, the reason for that is to avoid those layoffs that we talked about. At Delta, we, we are facing layoffs as well. We've got about 2,000 pilots that we haven't been able to, to make great progress with our union on. So there, there is a risk of furloughs at some, some portion of Delta. But across the industry, you're looking at tens of thousands of people facing layoff notices October 1st if the government doesn't come through with an extension. So it's hard, it's hard to predict. Um, you know, right now we've taken matters into our own hands. We didn't want to run the risk of, of whether the government would decide to, to support us or not. So the Delta people have, have made the decisions to save the jobs and take, take time off. Uh, we've seen in the news a scathing report around the 737 MAX, uh, and really accusing the FAA and Boeing of having too cozy a relationship and blaming them for those awful crashes. While Delta didn't fly that fleet, back in January, you said you hope to see it back in the sky. Do you still feel that way? Yeah, I still hope to see that plane in the sky. And I'm confident when it is approved and the regulators have had a chance to thoroughly inspect the aircraft, it will probably be the safest aircraft that's received the most attention of any aircraft ever built. Uh, you know, we don't fly the plane, as you say, but I do. I think it's it's not good for the industry to have these types of issues, whether we fly the plane or not. I do have confidence in Boeing, though we're disappointed. In, in what uh, what came out of the report, not just on the Boeing side, but also the regulatory side as to where the breakdowns that had occurred. Should consumers out there feel confident in our regulators, in the FAA? We assume they're working for us. And when you read a report like that, you start to think, uh, it seems like they're working for the industry. Well, two things on that. First, air travel in the United States is the safest form of transportation in the world of any form of transportation. So uh, yes, everyone should feel safe, absolutely safe being on an airplane. That's at the core of what we are. Our, we don't rely on the regulators to, to, monitor, to, to, to gauge the safety of our aircraft. We take that responsibility in the airline industry ourselves. The regulators reinforce that, they ensure compliance and they check on all the safety protocols that we deploy. There's an important element of this, though, Stephanie, we have to be careful about. If we put too much of a divide between the regulators and the OEM, say Boeing or the airlines, sometimes you get into, you, you, want, you want compliance, you want transparency, you want everybody having full access to all of the information and people volunteering when they see a problem. You don't want anyone in that chain holding something back for fear of what's going to mean. We want everybody to cooperate and provide as open and visible a, a signal if, when anytime you, you face a risk factor. And that's what the compliance of the FAA has provided. And that's why we do have as safe a culture as we do. The, the, the MAX is a one-off. I can't explain it. I, I'm not part of it. I, I've watched it. I've been as disappointed in the learnings. I think there were some motivations there to try to minimize pilot training or minimize the cost of, of upgrading the, the from a 7.3 NG to a MAX, so make it easier for the industry to to to, to purchase and, and implement the, the new technology faster. That was disappointing to find out. The refs shouldn't be the enemy, but they also shouldn't be our friends. They're here to make us better and safer. I do want to ask you Absolutely. about climate change for a moment. Right now, in the South, we've got uh, enormous flooding. In the West, we've got fires. There is a call to action when it comes to climate change. Do you expect to see commercial planes that do not rely on fossil fuels in our lifetime? I don't. I think that technology will come someday. Uh, the uh, the electrification using using different uh, sustainable aviation fuels and other other forms of energy at some point I think right now that, that it's cost prohibitive uh, at Delta we announced 
before the pandemic, though we're holding to it, a billion dollar commitment to invest in offset technology, new, new technologies to eliminate the footprint that we create over the next 10 years going forward. Uh, so we're working and we're providing the, the, uh, the level of investment in, in the new technologies, but it's gonna take some time before that comes about. I do want to ask what this has been like for you. I mean, this has been a brutal time for all of us from a health and an economic perspective and a cultural perspective. What has it been like for you? Has it changed you as a leader? It has. I think every aspect of the pandemic has impacted all of us, our daily walk, our our uh, relationships, uh, what we do, uh, our priorities in life. Uh, at Delta, we were at the highest high, best performing airline in the globe last year and coming off of a very high and going down right down to the bottom and in you know, the last 10 years of everything we built was decimated so there was initial there was some discouragement and disillusion which you can't help but we quickly picked ourselves up and realized that our future is still ahead of us and our company is a great company. We provide essential service. We provide critical services. That's one of the reasons why the government supported us during the pandemic, because they wanted to keep the airways open and keep people moving, and we are doing that. But also our company needs us like never before. And so Delta is a 95-year-old company. I tell our leadership team at all times, our company needs our leadership now more than any leadership team in our history. And we're going to pick this company up and we're going to put her back to her position of prominence where she belongs. And that's our charge. And so we're working hard to do just that. It's a marathon. This is not, this is going to take time. This is not a sprint, but we're, we're, we're on the right path. And while we're only at 30% of the way through the journey, we're going to get to the other end of this. Well, the only way we're going to get through this, Ed, is if we do it together. Thank you Absolutely. so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. I hope you found tonight's programming illuminating. We'll be back here tomorrow with the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, with Dr. Anthony Fauci, actor Billy Porter, and more. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to The Atlantic, and please look for our new book, The American Crisis, in bookstores near you and at our Atlantic Festival page at bookshop.org. We appreciate your support for our journalism and for watching this program. And we'll see you tomorrow. The ambitious journalism you see here tonight and across print and online can't be made without your support. Please become a subscriber today. You'll get unlimited access to the incredible journalism of TheAtlantic.com, 10 issues a year of our unrivaled print magazine, and much, much more.